job of survival The best place for me People are building bases As far as the eye can see Now the roads Take me home To my base Hey, hey guys, it's your boy DJ Herlogic here, coming at you with another episode of Survival Minecraft, episode 43. And today, I'm playing on two chunks render distance. But DJ, I hear you asking. I don't have up to find, so this is my zoom. What's all that back there? Well, that's spawn, believe it or not. I have it set to two chunks. And you can see right there is where it cuts off. But I have a mod set or a mod installed called Distant Horizons that lets you go about as far out as you want. And so you are currently looking at spawn. And if you're wondering, what does my base look like from spawn? It looks like this. Well, this wasn't here last time I was over here. So this kind of threw a little kink in my big reveal. It looks like that. Right there, there's my base. You can, in fact, see it from spawn if you are really anywhere. If you have your render citizens high enough. And you might be wondering, DJ, your base looks much taller than it did before. What's it look like? Well, it looks like this. It took just over a year, but I finally got the entire bottom part, minus the engines, complete. And I'm super excited about that. So I started working on the top part. And it's kind of kind of weird seeing all the torches because his those little like, all of those are torches. And now I hear you wondering, DJ, what are your frames like at a whatever render distance you have it? And my goodness, you have so many questions today. Well, for your information. I'm still running at around 60 frames per second, and I have it set to 512 chunks. So how them apples? I guess I'll give you a little bit of a rundown real quick. So here we have the beginning of the end of the entrance, or what will be the main entrance of the base. I now have a Ooh. So I have a creeper farm now. It works really well, even on multiplayer. It's gotten that full since I built it. Um, this iron farm isn't new, but this platform is new. These heads are new. That's new, but that's not important. Uh, my iron farm is slow, but steady. And I have the beginnings of a wheat farm, not a wheat farm, sugarcane farm right here. And I only have the two rows over there. Oh good, it is producing pretty good. I have a, this little bit of a sugarcane farm so I can get paper for rockets. Or at least a little bit of paper, maybe. The big problem with this whole thing is that there's going to be a lot of it. All of this is going to be sugarcane farm and all of this is going to be cactus farm. And Ben Jafar, J Ben Jeff, Jaffer, Jaffer, Ben, Ben just joined the game. And my voice sounds a little different because I'm still kind of recovering from a head cold I had over the weekend. I think my voice sounds kind of cool, but I know it won't last. So I'm not, I'm not trying to, uh, I'm not getting used to it, or, or um, uh, what's, what's the what's the phrase? Hey, future DJ here. I was trying to think of attached. I'm not getting attached to it. But in today's episode, this has been a really long intro. In today's episode, I am going to be working on my redstone museum that I had from season one on the Java survival server. This is technically the third iteration of it, but only the second time any version of it has been shown being built or on the, on the screen. So technically, it's also the second version. 
officially it's the third. And it's gonna have two layers. I can't get down there because it's just a, oops, I forgot I don't have Optifine. It's just a hologram. But before I actually start doing that, I need to get concrete. So let's get concrete. I miss Optifine. So I went ahead and gathered up all the concrete that I need as, as, long, as well as the other materials that aren't concrete. These are all the books for all of the um, lecterns. Man, help me with my mouth. I don't know what that is or how it got in there, but it was gross. And I got all the redstone that I need and all the colored dyes for the signs. So let's get started. Boats need brakes. Yes, they do. Let's get started. Piston feed tapes. These are useful when needing to make a nine segment display, such as a clock. They can also be useful for making doors or any other kind of gates. This particular one uses observers, so it just runs automatically, but you can also set it up so that it uh, runs off of input signals. You can look up YouTube videos for that because those are much more difficult to build up in a small space. This one is kind of loud since it's always running and it's just kind of freezing up every now and then because it's on a server. Moving on. Auto droppers. There are lots of different kinds of auto droppers. These two are both very simple and compact. This one's quite fast. This one's just kind of standard. It goes at the speed of a hopper, more or less. This one is better suited for projectiles. So you would probably use a dispenser, not a dropper. And this one, it just kind of, like I said, it goes at the speed of a hopper. Moving on. Double piston extenders. Here we have a standard uh, horizontal piston, double piston extender, and here we have a compact vertical double piston extender. The only thing that relate these two together besides having two pistons is that their timings have to be two, four, zero. That's how they work. The only caveat is that for any multi-piston extender that uses observers, you will almost certainly have to have two inputs to do a full cycle, whereas this one does the full cycle all by itself. Moving on. Rising edge and falling edge monostable circuits. They're pretty much the exact same structurally, except that this one, when you press the button, it'll give you one pulse tick at the start of the button. And this one will give a one pulse tick at the end of the button. You can use these in conjunction with each other to make timed circuits, but you can also just use them as their own things depending on what you need. Moving on. Slab and glass ladders. These can be used to compact redstone. That I have this one set up so that when you use the book, the signal will go up the ladder and eventually hit the top. This also doubles as an example to show how com how lecterns are also redstone components for some reason, as I just showed. They can be used as such. This is how my shop works. Redstone signals can go up the ladder, but they cannot come back down the ladder. So if you need to compact going down, you'll either have to use pistons with slimes and observers, or you'll just have to spiral it down like everybody else. Moving on. One tick pulses in monostable circuits. Oh, I forgot the button. There are two different ways of doing one tick pulses. This is the, the what I'm going to call the standard way. It could also be called the analog way, depending on how you want to look at it. This is how they used to be done before observers. Observers produce a one tick pulse, but they, re, they produce a one tick pulse every time they observe an update on a block. So that includes the observer moving it includes something being moved in front of it, something that's being changed between on and off. Anything that can be changed physically will be updated. Whereas this one does it every other time. This is, like I said, the standard way of doing it. This is how it used to be done. These 
are still very useful because like I said, this one will give a one tick pulse every time it sees an update, whereas this one will just do it the one time. Moving on. T flip flops. So it's kind of a weird name, but this here is also technically a T flip flop the way that it is set up. So the one tick pulse part is actually just this. But well, adding this makes it a T flip flop, which just means that you're changing a button input into what is effectively a lever input without having to use a lever. This one in particular is just silent because it uses repeaters and torches. So when I press this button, this turns on. When I press it again, it turns off. There are many different types of T flip flops. This one is silent. It's as far as the only, as far as I know, the only one that's silent. There are more compact T flip flops that require hoppers and droppers, but they make ticking sounds and can also break. So they're not as reliable. Moving on. Monostable circuits, also known as randomizers. This is a simple way of making a randomizer because of how droppers work. They will spit out one item at random within the nine by nine. The more items you put into it, the more random it will be. But you do need at least one item to be a non-stackable item, and the rest need to be items that cannot stack with each other. And you can have this really be filled either way with more non-stackable than stackable, or more stackable than non-stackable, which is the more common way of doing it because these are usually pretty expensive items. So when you put press the, the button, this will have a one in three chance of going all the way to the end because of the non-stackable item, just like that. And I have the sign in here to show that even though this will stack to 16, it doesn't actually affect this any because it doesn't register as being more than a normal non-stackable item. You can compound these by having a randomizer going into a randomizer, which if you have both of them completely filled up, that will be a one in nine chance multiplied by a one in nine chance, meaning you will have a one in 81 chance of actually getting it to go all the way to the end. Moving on. Pulse extenders. Here we have two pulse extenders that are basically the same, except this one on the left is a little bit shorter than this one on the right. And the only difference is this block here. And the reason it's shorter is because you can see how it goes to do to do to do to do to do all the way down. Well, it has one fewer to the dudes on this side than it does on this side as compared to this one. So it goes down faster on this side. However, you cannot have it be a block on this side because then it'll just stay on the entire time. There's nothing to go down. You can make these longer, just about as long as you want. But beware, at a certain point using buttons, it will not work as intended. It will just kind of run around and around and around until it finally dissipates. Whereas this here is on the whole time because both sides are lit at the same time. I have four buttons here because technically this is very, very slightly shorter than this. It doesn't seem like much, it's only one game tick, but it can actually make quite a big difference depending on what you're wanting done. Moving on. Basic pulse extender does the exact same thing as this, except this is how it was done before we had comparators. Again, these can still be useful because it gives a shorter pulse extender. And I don't remember doing it quite like that before. Oh, okay. I had the timings wrong. So as you can see, and as I told or said before, observers give one tick pulses, which means usually this would just spit it out like it did before. But because I have it slowing down with these, and because I'm using specifically a piston, I have to have this on two ticks. It's slowing down enough to not let go. 
Now, like I said, I have it set to two ticks on this one because it's a piston, otherwise it would do what it was doing. But normally you can do um, just one tick and then four ticks, and you wouldn't normally have an observer here. It would just be like a button. So I can demonstrate that here. It doesn't matter which one goes into a block, and it's not even necessarily required that it needs to be a block. It just saves redstone a little bit. So whereas this is like that, this one stays on for a little bit longer. It's not a no like a huge change, but again, it can still be useful. Moving on. And gates. These are a pretty simple logic gate. This is how you would make a combination lock. And as you can see, it's called an AND gate because both left and right and any other inputs that you have need to be turned off for this to actually turn off or unlock. It can't be just this one, can't be just that one, it has to be both. It's an AND gate. Moving on. OR gate. It looks very similar to the AND gate, except there are no torches because in this case, either the left or the right or both, obviously, can turn on the lamp. Moving on. Exclusive OR gate. I had to get far away because it's on the edge of the floor at the moment and I don't have the door set up yet because there would be glass here. In an exclusive OR gate, which is much more complicated than the standard OR gate, only the left or the right will turn on the lamp, but not both. I personally have never used this in anything because I just haven't really found a need for it yet. Obviously there are two comparators here, but they both have to be in subtract mode, which is somewhat explained, whoops. So, okay, that keeps happening because I have a button for it on my mouse now. In my Redstone Basics book, it goes into like the need to know things before starting redstone and I go into this. I won't really be going into that in this episode because or probably not in any episode just because it's a really long book. It's like 20 something pages. The exclusive or gate. Moving on. Stackable and non-stackable item sorters. This is probably one of the most frequently used circuits in most people's bases if they use redstone. It's just how you make a bulk storage system that's automated. It only sorts one item at a time. You can make much more complicated things that can sort multiple items into a single chest. I'm certainly not going to have that in a beginner's interactive museum. And the way that it works is that you have hoppers set up like this. The comparator reads out of this hopper here, which has the item that you want and 21 items that will not be filtered in and likely will never get sent through the item sorter. And that's because they are either renamed or there's just something that you will never be putting into your sorting system. Then here, one item will always be stuck. Nothing you can do about it. These numbers are only for items that stack to 64. For items that stack to 16, it'll be slightly less right here. And that's the only difference. Here I have what it will actually be in each hopper. And as you can see, if I do this, they come sorting through. And they come sorting through. However, if I have, let's say, something else in here, so that's all sorted through, but only that item. So these will not be getting into any of my storage system because they just simply are not iron. You don't have to strictly use these for sorting items into item sorters. In fact, you can use them to exclude things from item sorters or storage systems. I keep getting words mixed up. You can use these to exclude items from storage systems, such as rotten flesh. You can have this leading into a dropper, which then you can have an auto dropper spitting out all the rotten flesh as it comes through. Now here we have a non-stackable item sorter. Usually these just kind of get sent into the last chest of a thing, but you can in fact sort them out in a sense, probably just so that it gets spat out somewhere else, kind of like the rotten flesh example. We can put all of these and this and that in here. And they will all get sent into here. However, none of these or those or this should have. 
probably because I have it a little bit too close. Yes, I think it's because I had it too close. But everything else made it. Oh, this got burned. Why did that get burned out? I don't know. Weird. Okay, apparently there's some weird thing with torch burnout on the server. I don't know. Did anyone get... No, they still didn't go down there, so that's good, I guess. Anyway, moving on. RS Norledge. I made the book for it, but completely forgot to make it in the schematic of my base, so I decided to add it in right here. It's kind of centered behind these, but not really like in the way of anything too much. Anyway, RS Norledge. This is good for when you need something to happen once, but only once per cycle. As you can see, when I press this button, nothing happens. But when I press this button, something does happen, but not when I press it again, which means this will only be activated one time and then it cannot be undone until this happens. And then I can do this thing again, whatever that thing needs to be. RS Norlatch. Moving on. Zedoff switch. I don't know what its official name would be, but I first saw this in a video made by ZF on Hermitcraft. And basically it's a timing circuit of sorts. It just, it pretty self-explanatory like that. When you press the button or have a lever, either one, it will always do something and then do it in exact reverse as long, well, for two steps anyways. It's pretty useful. I use it quite a lot because I don't know of a simpler way of doing it. You can also do a similar thing with a rising and falling edge combination, but this is just a little bit simpler. Moving on. Triple piston extenders, not very frequently used, but they do exist. Pretty much any number of piston extender you need or want, someone's probably made. Like I said, these are not used very often. They've been kind of made redundant with the use of slime blocks. But here's a analog version that is a full cycle. And then here's a compact observer-based one. And like I said, any observer-based multi-piston extender will require at least two inputs. This one requires four. I don't know if there's a direct correlation between number of inputs required and number of pistons extended, but in this particular case, it requires four inputs to make a full cycle. Moving on. Hopper clock or hopper timer. Often used for making things happen automatically on a specific time. It works by having comparators read these two hoppers which are feeding into each other. In this particular case, I only have 16 just so that it goes fairly quickly. And that's about that. You take the output either from these or you can take it from here specifically. And that's about that. Also, my mic died. So I'm using my headset for the moment. Moving on. Button or lever spam prevention, AKA green proofing. This is pretty much the exact same as this. Except whereas this uses two sticky pistons, this uses a sticky piston and a normal piston. No matter how many times I flip this, it will only happen until it ends. There are other ways of doing this, but this way is pretty simple. Moving on. Flying machines. I didn't realize how loud this side was until just now. There are lots of different kinds of flying machines. Here are a couple. This one in particular is one of the simplest ones. It pretty much just goes these two directions. I don't know if it can be flipped vertically or not, but this particular uh, observer here is not actually needed for this particular flying machine, except that the fact that it can only go and then it'll stop once it hits something. So this is just going to activate that redstone down there to make it come back. This one, on the other hand, is a lot more complicated and actually can return by itself because of this and this. It is very important to make sure that these are in the right spots, otherwise it, stuff will break. So just to show as an example. And that's how those work. 
I'm going to get out of this area because it's super loud. And that's pretty much everything in this Redstone Museum, except for the door. I haven't made the door yet. I won't be, I don't think I'll be doing it in this episode, but I'll probably be doing it before I actually open the museum to the public. So before I end this episode, I want to see just how much we've, how much uh, sugar cane we've gotten in the little bit of time that we've done this. It's actually not really been a little bit of time because I did AFK quite a bit to get enough snow to do some of the uh, detailed work on the outside of the museum. Holy cow, that's a lot more than I was expecting. Sweet. Well, button button. That's all the time I had for today. If you had fun, please leave a like. If you really had fun, consider subscribing. I'll see you guys in the next one. Never road, take me home to my base. Made a black star east of Jenga. Near Mesa, take me home.